Health Services Manager here at the library. And I'm so happy that Dr. Flam and Dr. Stebbin are here with us in person to do this, this program. Um, so this is one of our first hybrid programs. So I'm just gonna talk about the format a little bit. So we have an in-person audience. We have a virtual audience. We will have a discussion and then a Q&A afterwards. And also because we have a, um, a small masked audience that we've been able to socially distance, um, Dr. Flam and Dr. Seven um, will, will do the uh, talk unmasked. Um, and Dr. Er, David Seven is the author of Promised Land, How the Rise of the Middle Class Transformed America, uh, 1929 to 1968, shown here, which is primarily intended for educated general readers. He's a specialist in modern American political and legal history. A native of Rhode Island and Maryland, he teaches history and law at Ohio State University. And Michael Flam is the author of several books, including In the Heat of the Summer, The New York Riots of 1964 and the War on Crime, and also professor of history at Ohio Wesleyan University. So please welcome Dr. Seven and Dr. Flam. Well, thank you very much, Whitney. Thank you all for coming either in person or online, joining us remotely. Um, it is wonderful to be here this evening. I want to begin with two um, pledges for you. The first is that we will stop conversing by 7.45, so there is time for Q&A and questions. And I also want to promise that we will stop at 8 p.m. Those of you who are online can feel free to leave. If any of you here still have questions to ask, I'm sure David will be happy to answer them as well. And we'll put on masks as well for that portion of anything that extends past eight o'clock. But I just want to let everyone know right at the outset. So, but thank you again. And you know, it's such a pleasure to be here with David. We've been colleagues and friends for a long time. And I enjoyed his book a great deal, but I also want to reassure our conversation tonight is going to be about the present and the future. We may look to the past once in a while, but this is not going to be a purely historical discussion because uh, David and I are interested in this moment, okay? This moment and what it means for the middle class and for the future of this nation economically and politically. So um, David, I'd just like to begin by asking you a, a kind of a question about definition. How do you define the middle class today? Who exactly um, is place. the middle class? And then maybe you could also sort of, is that similar to different to what we saw in the past? Right, and that's a great question. Very different definitions are in the hands of different people. People removed windows depicting rock TV and stuff like that. definition would be people who cannot fairly be described as either rich or poor. It's a very expansive definition by world historical standards. Uh, and there are ambiguous groups because change, there's change over time. And my personal favorite uh, is upper middle class people. In the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, when taxes on the upper middle class were very high because of World War II and the Cold War, upper middle class people lived more like middle, middle class people, if that makes sense. When taxes on the upper middle class came down a lot under Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, over the decades that followed, upper middle class people, in terms of how they live, have become more upper again. So they're an ambiguous group. Do most upper middle class people today still think of themselves as middle class? They do. But given how much bigger their houses are, how much more expensive their cars are, and so on, do most people with ordinary incomes today think of upper middle class people as middle class? So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question because you mentioned cars and houses. Right. Your definition of the middle class is very much based on income. What about education and other factors that may affect how somebody defines themselves? That also has changed over time. So in the 40s and 50s and 60s, most middle class people went to high school and no more unless they served in the military and the military paid for them to go to college. So that was the world of middle class educated people. Nowadays, a lot of people are middle class people go beyond high school, but many of them start but don't finish on their four-year degrees or spend two years at a community college, right? And so college itself is a very varied thing and has become more so over time. How would you characterize the, the state of the middle class today in the United States? Well, and there's an army of economists and social scientists who work on this. So 
as recently as about 1970, a little over 60% of the population to economists was middle class, the middle fee, three fifths of the income distribution, essentially. And that has fallen, most economists say, to about half, which means the middle class is still a big move in terms of income, but smaller than it used to be. But another meaningful change has been also in wealth, right? In, in other words, uh, middle class people of the 50s and 60s tended to have, they owned assets, they had money in the bank, they were buying houses that they paid off, and they tended to live frugally, so they accumulated money for old age. According to most economists, now roughly half of the population is in households that have a net worth of zero or less, which is not very different from what the situation was in the late 1920s. Well, lots of, lots of um, experts are saying that they're seeing extraordinary levels of anxiety and insecurity among those who consider themselves middle class today. Um, why is that? Well, it's the result of multiple factors. If in terms of where we are at this moment, the pandemic has made a lot of people feel more insecure, including financially because of the change in the job structure. But to give you an example of how things have changed since the early 70s, as wealth distribution and income distribution have changed, so has the marketplace in America and magazines newspaper advertising, what's in stores, and perhaps crucially, what's on TV. In other words, it's a system, television, that's financed by advertising. And so if income distribution and wealth change, and people in the top that become much more affluent, ever more of the programming is set in their homes. And so a lot of people with more ordinary incomes, their sense of what's normal in terms of consumption has changed. And so from the point of view of a middle-class person in 1970, do a lot of middle-class people spend too much on themselves? They do, in part because their sense of what's normal consumption is increasing. Well, let me push you on that point a little bit. Sure. What do you see as the, you know, the main factor or factors for the anxiety and insecurity of the middle class today? You've suggested like the media coverage, the pandemic, uh, oh, no, economic, what do you see as the main reason for, for the anxiety that so many people have. Unemployment skyrocketed when the pandemic arrived. So in the very short, you know, the last few years, there's that. But the other thing is, ever more Americans don't have much in the way of savings. And so if something goes wrong, what should be a sort of a hiccup becomes almost a family crisis. And so there's been a gradual increase in sort of economic insecurity anyway. And the pandemic has greatly magnified. So would it be fair to say the pandemic is like an accelerant Perfect. to these other trends that were already existing in right. society before the right. last 18 months? Right. And so you can have a very robust uh, debate about uh, who or what is most responsible for the change. But there are a lot more people who live paycheck to paycheck than they used to. Let's pick up on that point. I want to let, let's, let's sort of make clear. What are the stakes here? Why does it matter that the middle class is insecure, anxious, possibly shrinking? In terms of the future of this country, why do you think that's a critical issue? Well, I mean, again, there's a debate about this. I think that the single biggest problem is the fraction of the society that is able to fend to a large degree for itself because it has made prudent choices and has adequate income and, and security has been dropping. And so the burden of the economically insecure is not their problem alone. It also burdens the society in general, if that makes sense, especially since the 1930s, especially since the 1960s, when social programs now make the problems of the poor and the almost poor everyone's problems mm -hmm. because the rest of the society is responsible for that. Is this to what degree is this also part of our political climate then and, and shaping that effect? Right. Well, in the 1960s, when ever greater suburbanization was taking more and more jobs out of central cities, a lot of poor people who live in central cities rioted, right? And a lot of prosperous middle class suburbanites were puzzled by why this was happening. So there's a contemporary debate now about 
why are middle class people so angry? And they are utterly aware that the system does not work as well for them as it used to. Uh, and income and wealth inequality, the, the increase in that is very visible in society. Uh, and the pandemic, of course, has made these tensions greater. Mm -hmm. right? and so there are poor people who are angry, in part because of the employment problems created by the pandemic. But what is sort of new in the politics of the country in these decades is how angry a lot of class people have become mm -hmm. with a system that seems to provide ever more rewards to a ever smaller fraction of people. And you say anger in the system. This seems like a perfect moment for us to turn to President Biden, okay, who at this moment sort of embodies at least part of that system. And, and you and I have talked about this before. Um, why is he such an important figure and why is this moment so important in your view? Well, uh, you can again have different thoughts about Joe Biden. What is indisputably true is that he grew up in a middle class world. And there are different eras of that. He was born in 1942. And for the next 30 years before he was elected to the US Senate, <clears throat> the middle class rose and he rose with it. And if you were a healthy, uh, reasonably intelligent white male living in the prosperous industrial north, he was literally like standing on an escalator for that generation of white men. And so he went farther in terms of his formal education than anyone else in his family had ever gone. And then, of course, he ran for and was elected to the Senate at a very young age, uh, in part because. He came from such a small state that he did not require huge sums of money to mount a winning campaign. So, A, he's middle class in his background, socialization, but he's also middle class from an era when middle class people <clears throat> were better able to realize their full potential, especially the men in that group. Does that make sense? So, he has a very high opinion of middle class people. Uh, did the rise of the middle class bring out the better angels of their natures? It really did. It made them more supportive of various kinds of social reform in the 1960s, for example. Or if you prefer another example. Well, let me just ask you, based on what you said, is President Biden then more sympathetic, more understanding of the plight of the middle class than, let's say, other political leaders or figures we've had in recent years? Right, and again, it's become so expensive to run for high public office that it is increasingly something that affluent people do, right? right? And so he's become an outlier. Uh, and he has spent, he's most comfortable around middle class people. Uh, and uh, he has a lot of sympathy for them. And the really interesting thing is, what can he as president actually do to help them to revive them? I mean, the reason why I ask you that question, David, and this is where I think it's interesting, you can look at President Biden and say, as you've said, uh, that he's, you know, a product of the middle class and whatever. But I could also say, you know, he's a creature of Washington. You know, he's been in Washington for 40 years, uh, you know, as a U.S. senator. And so, you know, you put a lot of weight on his upbringing and where he's from. I could turn around and say to you, he's been living in Washington as a U.S. senator for so long that, that I'm a little skeptical that he well, really cares or thinks about the right class. Many people are. His nickname, while he was in the Senate, given to him by his fellow senators, was middle class Joe. And how wealthy were most senators by the 1970s who joined the Senate? Quite wealthy. And have they become even more so? So from then, it was sort of a, a condescending nickname. But he embraced it he actually likes being middle class. And he was sort of a novelty. So does he view himself as an advocate for that? He does. Has he been able to do much for them as a senator? Not a lot, right? Uh, and so when he was asked by Barack Obama, will you be my running mate in 2008? Joe Biden had exactly one question before he said yes. He said, are you really serious about trying to revive the middle class? And Barack Obama said, yes, I really mean it. Then I'll do it, right? And so uh, if you are inclined to be cynical, you look at Joe Biden and say, here he is, this creature of the Washington staff, which in this four decade long period hasn't really helped the middle class prosper, right? right? So it's done other things. Uh, the 
the outcomes, public policy wise, are not the ones Biden would have liked. Right. And that's the point, right? And he, that's what he would say were he here. In other words, I'd like to change the direction of the country on this fundamental question. Well, the reason why I ask you this is because I'm sort of fascinated. Uh, I think there's a great deal of anger and frustration and anxiety across the political spectrum right now. And we've seen in recent years some voters turn to the outsider, right? The outsider to sort of channel that feeling and that anger. And then in this last election, there were just enough people who said, no, you know, we'll, we'll come back to Biden, um, maybe because he's middle class, you know, despite his Washington background or something like that. You know, what, what's your sort of take on that in this issue of, you know, anger and frustration in our choice of leaders? Right. Well, the, the candidate who channeled the anger more, uh, especially a lower middle class white man, was Donald Trump in 2016. And he's his own version of this. In other words, he's also older, born in 1946. And his family was never middle class. They drove Cadillacs. Uh, they were affluent people. But the dad's business was built providing apartments for middle class New Yorkers in the post-World War II period. And quality time with dad, or Donald Trump, was working in the office with him, literally. And what did Donald Trump and Fred Trump, his dad, like about it? Those customers did not condescend to them. In other words, they felt comfortable around them. The dad tells Donald Trump in the early 1970s, the middle class is increasingly not going to have enough money to buy or rent apartments, new ones anyway, in New York City. So you're going to have to go to Manhattan and do the Trump Tower, which is what the son does. Uh, does he encounter all kinds of condescension from the long-standing affluent developers of Manhattan? He does. So and this is not a def- in other words, this is not a defense of Donald Trump. It's an expert. In his own mind, he's a kind but of. But what's is you, you sort of pivoted back to my original point, which is that being middle class is much more than about income, oh. and it's much more about money. It's also about sort of you know cultural values, exactly. and, uh, and they're all related in America. Like because the media people. system is so heavily influenced by advertising. So in the 50s and 60s, when the greatest growth in income is in the middle three fifths, the living rooms and kitchens of ordinary middle class people are what you see in magazines and in TV shows and, and the clothes and the haircuts, right? Let me, let me ask you a question. And the musical preference. Since so you brought it up before, I'm just I'm struck by your comment. President Obama and Joe Biden. Uh, who's more middle class? In, in what sense, Mike? Well, I mean, just in terms of income and economic background, until Obama wrote his memoir and got money from that, Biden would actually have more money than Obama. But if you ask people to, who is middle class, Joe Biden or Barack Obama, I think you people might say, Joe Biden, but that would be a reflection. I, I don't know. It's just fascinating to me, I, you know, that well, the Biden's... Trouble with, the trouble, Barack Obama defies easy categories yeah, because his background is so unusual. Right. His household is basically supported for most of his childhood by the grandmother, who was a bank vice president. Okay. So that's the, the, that's the wager or the breadwinner uh, in their household. The mom has a doctorate. So, but does she ever succeed in getting stable academic employment? She does not. So it's, he is both more educated and goes to fancier schools than middle class people. But in terms of real cash income that his parents make that comes to him, he isn't at all. Joe Biden is conventionally middle class in a post World War II sense, mm-hmm. right? And so President Obama in many ways is an exotic person, right? And, and uh, and by the way, they end up in Honolulu, uh, his mother's family, because it's one of the very few places where there is tolerance in that era for multiracial kids. Right? It's the idea of moving to Honolulu is it'll be easier for Barack. And it is. So let's shift now from sort of personalities and politics. Do you think that President Biden's plans to revive the middle class will work or not? I mean, I, by the way, it's unclear politically, you know, what's coming ahead. But, but 
What do you think? Well, what's so interesting about the timing of this conversation is the Senate and the House are approaching sort of a crossroads on this, and so are the two major parties. And Biden has this idea that if you create a lot more good jobs for people with no in high school, that will help provide the middle class. And that is rooted in his own historical experience. Right? So the question is whether or not Congress can be persuaded to embrace that vision. And what is the logic behind that? How will creating good jobs for people without college degrees ultimately benefit the larger middle class that does have college degrees? Well, they have college. A lot of them don't have college degrees, okay, that's especially right. four year degrees. Right. Right. If you, if you, uh, by the way, if it's mostly building infrastructure in the old fashioned sense, most of that workforce is made. Right, which is one of the most tense things about this, even though it's not often discussed that way, was the earlier middle class era male dominated. It absolutely was. It was driven by a male breadwinner of love. Right? So, would most Americans embrace that enthusiastically today? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, and so, uh, can you have a new and improved version that is not so intensely male breadwinner in its orientation? Well, it also wouldn't reflect the demographics that we see in higher education. But I, I sort of want to dig down again on this point, which is, I mean, do you think that President Biden's plan, assuming that it goes through, that his ideas will revive the middle class? Do you think it will work? Well, it depends on how much is done and for how long, right? The last time the middle class grew a lot in that era that Joe Biden Partly it was the result of the pervasive economic insecurity of the New Deal, which prompted a whole lot of folks who don't ordinarily feel insecure to support public policies that help provide greater security for lots of folks. So the most important domestic policy achievement of the New Deal is social security. And there were all kinds of people who didn't think social security was necessary for them until the Great Depression came along. And then they did. Uh, and so the pandemic has had something like that feeling or created something like the same consequence for a whole lot of folks. Mm -hmm. It has reminded them that they are economically more vulnerable than they imagined and vulnerable in other ways, right? And so, but the depression alone, I don't think could have created a huge expansion of the middle class. It was the combination of the Great Depression and then the national security challenges, crises of the 40s and 50s, together all of that, uh, and so one important part of this conversation is uh, what is the future for American national security, right? Uh, and the UN General Secretary, uh, two days ago in his keynote address to the UN, said the world is on the brink of an abyss and is going in the wrong direction. Does it feel like that in central Ohio? No, it doesn't, but how yeah. insolent. Well, <laughs> it does to people who follow this. How insolent is central Ohio from the outside world? But see, I would argue, and I, yes. I guess I'm going to agree with the, the audience member who chuckled here. I think, first of all, it's all relative, and the levels of insecurity and anxiety here may not be as high as in some places, but it's much higher than it's been here. Well, no, my point was that, that a different one. I talk to people who say, well, that earlier era that Joe Biden grew up in is irrelevant because so much of it revolved around a bigger national state that was pulled into creation, if you want to put it that way, by uh, deep-seated concerns about national security. And that era is over. Uh, how anyone could know that for sure at this moment in world history, I can't imagine, if that, if that makes sense. Uh, if the, would the UN General Secretary generally have a better sense of whether there's an impending crisis in the world than most of us? Well, I, I want to ask you, I would think so. You made a reference back to the 1930s and then World War II and then the Cold War, and I don't want to go back too far in history, but I want to sort of was the rise of the middle class the product of this unique historical moment or set of circumstances? And is there any realistic way for President Biden through his program to recreate something that, that emerged in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s for the reasons you suggested? Well, it, I don't think he wants to create an international crisis or a global one. It's really the question is how do you respond to the crisis? 
World War II was and the Cold War were waged in New Dealish ways. What does that mean? Did the tax structure change greatly in a way that promoted greater income and wealth equality? It did. When we had the attacks on 9 11, was there any such change in the tax structure? There were not, right? And so you can respond to Christ. If Joe Biden is faced with a 9 11 situation, how likely is it he will respond to it in a Bush Cheney like way? Very unlikely, right? And so, and, but who the heck knows if he will have one and who would want one, right? And so, so in other words, your question in some sense is unanswerable. We do not have crystal ball. Well, you know what? This is where I love We have these conversations all the time, these discussions, right? And you dodge. And you deflect. So I'm going to put you on the spot. You know, to you, 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 you. All right, well, I'll bottom line, are you optimistic or pessimistic about President Biden's ability to revive the middle class in this country? Well, the first step is the infrastructure bill pending in Congress. Yeah. Let me answer that. Okay. By the way, if you've ever seen a movie called My Dinner with Andre, right, which is all about two people talking, Mike and I regularly have lunch at some place that's having a bargain buffet on Main Street, my lunch with Mike, and we do, so we do this before, uh, and we'll do it again. Uh, but the point is- He's dodging and deflecting again, but he'll get to that answer. No, no, he'll get to that answer. I, he wants me to make a prediction, which is impossible to make in the current situation, but are there tendencies, right? And so here's the latest, the, the latest straw in the wind. Both parties are divided. Right? And so this is one of the reasons why the infrastructure proposal in Congress, the smaller of the two, is in peril. Does the right wing of the Republican Party, which is dominated by the conservatives, does it want to stop this altogether? It does. Does the left wing of the Democratic Party in Congress want the infrastructure spending to be a whole lot more ambitious than a traditional infrastructure program? It does. Will the wings defeat the middle on this? At this moment, it's not quite clear, right? Uh, and one of the challenges here is, of course, that money and wealth are not just, money is not just a medium of exchange, it's also a source of political power. So as the middle class has gotten smaller and less affluent, its ability to influence Washington decision makers has gone down. Does that make sense? So both of the two major parties have become more responsive to more affluent people of different kinds with different priorities. But I'm still gonna ask you, if President Biden gets everything he wants, miraculously, he gets everything he wants and his program gets through Congress, as it's currently set up, will it revive the middle class? And what did I just tell you about the national security side? Ah, okay, so. So how likely is it the country will experience greater national security challenges in the decades ahead? Will they be met in a way that shares the burden more broadly than that burden has been shared in the last 20 years? If it is, then that would also contribute to reviving the middle class. I like your use of the word share because to me that, that brings up something really fundamental and important, which is that the growth of the middle class in the 40s which was very much a collective development, okay? It was, it was broad-based, it was collective, it was people rising together to some degree, some more than others, but rising together. And I think this is my perception, I'm curious what you think. Today, we're much more focused on individual achievement. And it's very much more of a zero-sum world in which my success inevitably has to come at someone else's expense. And, and I think that there's less, how would you, Look at that collective versus individual. Well, one of the practical considerations that's working against individualism at the moment is the greater economic insecurity and lower real incomes of middle class people. So one of the more remarkable things is how many families uh, have people who are adults still living with them. And you could view this as a negative thing, but is this an utterly practical response to lower incomes? Mm -hmm. So more families where the kids live at home if they're middle class when they go to college. Right. Uh, especially community college. More families where in their 20s they're still at home because they haven't really fat, you know, underemployment is a common thing for them, and they're burdened by debts, student loans, and the like. And so uh, and so philosophically, 
People today are more individualistic than they were in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. But the headwinds of these other considerations are making people more collective, at least in terms of households, than they were 30 years ago, for example. And I love your choice of metaphor, headwinds, because I might describe it as we're sort of living in this perfect storm yeah. of circumstances that are contributing to people's anxiety and insecurity. Right. And one need, Joe Biden is a cosmic optimist. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, there's something surreal about this to many people. On the other hand, has his own lifetime, has he risen? Has he done far more than he ever thought he would? He had. And did he see what the middle class could do and be? Uh, in, and so a lot of that informs his sort of sense of optimism. Mm -hmm. uh, how realistic it is, is a really interesting question. But uh, to go back to the larger question, can you reorient politics and public policy in a way that puts us on a path to ever greater improvements in the size and stability of the middle class? A new and improved version of that, right? We're going to find out, right? By the way, if you're skeptical, words cannot fully capture how skeptical many people were about Ronald Reagan's program in the first two years. And one need not be a Reagan enthusiast uh, to remember this. In other words, after two years in public office as president, his approval rating in January of 1983 was 35%. And the New York Times, on a Sunday edition of January to mark the second anniversary of his inauguration, wrote a lead editorial that said that a pall of failure hangs over the Reagan presidency. And then, of course, within a year or two, the Reagan revolution arrived, right? And, and Reagan and Biden have some things in common in the sense that they're both older and didn't get elected president until they were on their third try. And Ray, Biden, like Reagan, both of them, when they first came in, were viewed as people not likely to change a whole lot, right? And so in the Reagan case, that decide for yourself what you think of this, but Reagan was ultimately cosmically optimistic and fairly successful in reorienting public policy in the direction you want it. Right? And, and by the way, just to reinforce your point, um, we often don't recognize transformation figures when they first arrive. I could even go back and say Franklin Roosevelt was not perceived by, by most people to be a transformational figure, you know, and then things changed in that way also. Well, and to go back to the national security issue, because they're related, <clears throat> the second Roosevelt term was much less successful than the first. And if he had been term limited and had not been able to run again, I suspect that historians today would say of Franklin Roosevelt that he was a very gifted politician who never quite panned out because the Great Depression is still there after two terms. But of course, it is the fact that he stayed and presided so capably and effectively over American entry and participation in World War II that ultimately gave him the reputation that he has today. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, I also would like to be optimistic. Uh, I think we all want to stay positive if we can and try to. to um, but I do have to ask you, what do you see as the consequences if we can't revive the middle class, if we can't sort of, you know, correct the widening inequality, economic inequalities and other things that we seem to do? What, what if we continue to pull away from where we've been? Well, it's a very good question, and I think about it a lot. So the one of the most troubling things about this is that, you know, remember I said that as the middle class rose, it brought, brought out the better angels of their natures. The reverse can also be true. Uh, and so just to give an example of one issue, as the middle class rose in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, anti-Semitism in this country declined. And as the country has moved in the opposite direction, with wealth and income inequality have grown, the search for scapegoats in certain quarters has resumed. Uh, and so there's a, a sort of minority version that's targeting people. There's an immigrant version. There's a Jewish community version of this. And so the stakes for lots of people in this, even if they themselves are not personally middle class, right, are high. And so one of the interesting questions is, if we continue down the path of suggesting that things get steadily worse, 
Uh, you can make people who are ordinarily rational almost crazy, right? Uh, especially because the technology of today, unlike before, makes it easier for people who are dangerous to communicate with each other and build networks. Uh, and so it's extremely, one of the crucial questions is will people who are affluent and educated join the ranks of those who are trying to solve this problem? Of reviving the world class, even if they themselves are not. And there was some, the Roosevelt's were not middle class, to give one example, right? Uh, and so, can you find people in their world like that again? Uh, and that question, and it was in part because the Apple was so much more so than they used to be. So, if they put their mind to it, they have to produce a lot of important results. So, uh, and so, and I'm actually kind of quietly optimistic about. So, but I'm not certain about that. It would be impossible to do at this point. And so just to be clear, you think that Biden is certainly going to be the last president who sort of reflects that generational as well as middle-class perspective. Right. Practically speaking, he, it's his age. In other words, to be old enough to remember that era vividly and to have lived through it, he would now have to be as old as he is. And I don't think we're going to get a president older than he is. Right. And so what's so interesting at this moment is actually to have a veteran of that era, if you want to put it that way, in the White House. But one of the, probably the key reason why he's there is he actually understands middle class people and their grievances uh, in a way that a lot of people who come from more affluent backgrounds or who are younger and don't remember that era, they just don't. They don't get it. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, he can go back to Scranton or Wilmington, Delaware, and talk to middle class people and he utterly understands where they're coming from, right? The, another interesting question is, it's all about trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Would people who have done better in some ways have to accept certain changes that would not be necessarily their first choices in order for the middle class to become bigger? And that's, and that's my point about a collective Correct. achievement and some sacrifice. And which brings me back to national security emergencies because they tend to persuade people to behave in the way of describing more than anything else, right? And, and so, so, as a someone, I would say skeptic. Perhaps I would say I would say one might have thought that the pandemic would represent the kind of crisis that might bring us together, but of course, it hasn't done that. Although, what has it done to the bafflement of right-wing Republicans or fiscal conservatives? Has it motivated Congress to spend unprecedented sums of money helping people who are poor and almost poor? It has. And do, do voters in surveys, 70 plus percent say they want the infrastructure bill. Mm -hmm. Of course, they do. In other words, a, a lot of fiscal conservatives in Congress are aghast. In other words, don't people seem to realize that this will all have to be paid for one way or another? Mm -hmm. uh, do voters seem to care? Mm -hmm. they, in other words, they think the need to do these things all of a sudden trumps whatever the cost may be down the road. Right? And that is a revolution that has sort of rocked the Washington establishment. Well, I think that's a good point for us to stop talking for a little bit and to see whether we have any questions. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, the uh, breakoff point I felt was uh, as far as the history of back going back for about 50 years was uh, when Reagan killed the unions. When Reagan changed the uh, tax structure from a 70% tax on money over a certain amount to 40% or whatever, and then um, started the uh, endless war mentality, although that was sort of there before with the Korean War, but um, we, we, we've kind of launched into that monotone dreariness that you can't get a good job. You can't get health care. You can't get. You can't get anything. I mean, I had free education. Mm -hmm. I was in the army. I had free education from that. Um, I had a good job that provided benefits, so I got free health care now. Um, look at people now that they're struggling with student loans. They're struggling with. Uh, they're going bankrupt because of uh, cost of um, medical. Uh, 
healthcare. These are things that didn't exist. They did not exist before. Um, it's been a downhill slide for a lot of people that would have been 40, 50, $60,000 wage earners with a nice union job and good benefits. That, that doesn't exist. So uh, we're, those, those people are getting killed and they have to go take three jobs and their wife gets sick and who do they blame? Well, and just to say a few words about unions, Joe Biden is an unabashed union enthusiast because did he literally see how unions, at least for a while, lifted people around where he grew up into the middle class? They did, but that was an era when trade policies were different and foreign competition was very weak, right? And so in terms of trade-offs that some people might not want, I cannot imagine reviving private sector trade unionism in this country without more barriers to for cheap, low-wage foreign competition. Would most Americans, if you gave them a poll, vote for that today? I suspect two-thirds of them would. Would that be profoundly unpopular with the people who have gained the most from both here and abroad from low trade barriers? And by the way, they need not go as high as they used to be. There are middle positions on this. Uh, but would goods get more expensive? They would, right? Do you see Reagan as the, the crucial turning point as sort of suggested here? Well, this was the moment. Well, there is a moral road. <laughs> well, there is a longer, to, you know, you can defend the, the economy when Ron Reagan was elected was not in good shape. And that's a mild comment. I can be, make that more pronounced. Did his Nixon policies revive prosperity? It did. Did it promote more overall prosperity and more inequality all at the same time? It did, right? So, and there have been pluses and minuses associated with that. Is the not-for-profit sector much larger than it used to be? Because people in the top fifth of the income distribution have more money than they used to be. It is. So there are some positives. Are there also very serious negatives? There are. So, so I, I suspect that President Biden would be here. He'd say, I'm utterly enthusiastic about reviving unions, right, for workers as a way that would raise their pay. When I talk to ordinary Americans about this, some like it, some don't. The analogy I like to draw is where you shop for groceries. If you shop at Walmart, where workers are very poorly paid, are the groceries cheaper? They are. If you go to Target, where the workers are much better paid, are, is everything in that store more expensive than Walmart? It is. Well, be Costco. Well, I, I think you take my point. Most Americans would love to live in a world where things cost more like what they do at Target. If that meant workers were much better paid and the middle class was bigger and more secure. And there's no easy answer to that question. How accustomed have people become to paying really low prices for clothes made by people who pay almost or get paid almost nothing by American standards? And I don't want to pick up on your point. I think your point about the debt load really, really important too. A lot of the prosperity that was experienced over the last 20 and 30 years was, was based on rising debt levels that people were undertaking. And that, that's a big issue there, I think, that you've touched on. Or, or we've traded high paying, good jobs with benefits for cheap junk at Walmart. I, I don't think that's a good choice. And I would put it differently. In other words, what the 50s and 60s economy was great at was producing jobs in the middle. Do we have more highly paid, high-end jobs than we used to? We do. Do we have more low-end jobs? Do we have fewer in between? Right? And so, uh, and so, and I don't want to read, it's not a history talk, it's a contemporary talk. Can we revive well-paid middle-class jobs? Can, but along with that, in order for that to work, can you revive a culture of middle-class frugality? Um, <laughs> if, you, if you talk to 20 somethings, do they buy cheap beer and ride bicycles? Are they more frugal than their parents? A lot of them. They are of necessity, right? So, in other words, I actually think Joe Biden communicates best with older people like him and 20 somethings who get where he's coming from. They communicate, he communicates less effectively with 55 year olds who are used to 
the revolution that has happened since the 1980s, if that makes sense. And there's also a regional dimension to this. Do they spend more on themselves in the Sun Belt and on the coasts than in the heartland? How far do you have to look at Ohio to find prosperous people who are frugal, even today, right? And so culturally, and we haven't talked a lot about culture, but they're all related. The 40s, 50s, and 60s was the Midwestern moment in American popular culture. Can the country as a whole become more Midwestern again in that way? Uh, or to put it in a different way, can New York and California become more like Ohio and Iowa in the daily activities of the populace? If you talk to Ohioans and Iowans, does that sound like a good idea? I'm not sure it would sound like a good idea to New Yorkers. Correct. So That's my opinion. Will this, I know, this, go that way also, will right? this <laughs> ask more of people on the coasts in terms of adaptation than it asks of people in the heartland? So what is your middle class then? New Yorkers make, if they lived here and had that lifestyle, they'd be way upper. But yet in New York, they're more middle. Well, the- I don't- I don't actually- middle middle class middle. is funny to me. I just don't, it, it seems geographical. Well, or it's a mentality. Well, it's the cost of living is highest. Uh, in places like New York and San Francisco. And so there's hardly a middle class at all in the traditional sense, right? If you're in the middle three-fifths of the income distribution, you typically don't buy a home, you just rent one. If you're under the age of 40, it's because the houses are now so expensive, you need the apartments, right? You could recreate a situation where that's different, but it would make New York and San Francisco very different from what they are today. Right. By the way, we have a lot of national political leaders who come from those places, and they struggle to understand what middle class means. And they usually do it by talking to their parents. You know, if you're Chuck Schumer or Nancy, in other words, they themselves don't live this way anymore, but at least they have some relevance. In other words, when I talk to people in New York, they say, oh, I can remember when my parents first paid off the mortgage on their suburban ranch house, 1,300 square feet. Why? Because it was the biggest thing that ever happened financially in their adult lives, right? It was a magical moment. So unless you, but unless you're elderly, uh, you know, old, it, 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 this era is not one that's familiar to you personally. Lindsay, are there other questions? Well, that's a very good point. Are there other questions? You don't have any, no questions. I wanna, I wanna come back to your, your point before. And I, I think your, your question about Reagan, um, as I think about it, a lot of this middle class story that you're telling is about a search for security. Correct. And what I believe that what Reagan and conservatives were arguing from the 80s forward is that opportunity, opportunity matters more than security. And I'm wondering to what extent that's the big philosophical divide here. Well, the, the Reagan staffers like to talk about the conservative opportunity society. More greater risk, greater reward, or more personal freedom, to use a 60s term. And Americans, of course, like many other people, would like to have a lot of each, a lot of freedom, and a lot of security. Specific social conditions can give rise to a stronger preference for one or the other. The specific economic and social conditions of the Great Depression, World War II, and the Cold War gave that generation of Americans a really strong, pronounced preference for security. And then if you have, if you overdo that, will you create a rebellious second generation that is more valuing a person of freedom? And, and that happens, and there's a liberal version, there's a conservative version of this. So, but in recent decades, as the real economic security of the broad middle class has waned, even before the pandemic, and as the outside world has become scarier again, the preference for security has grown. And I want to pick up on your last point in honor of your colleague who's in the room right now, which is there's an element to the story we haven't talked about, which is the whole globalization element right. and the extent to which it may not be possible for the United States to insulate itself or chart its own destiny because we're now part of this global world where the economic structures and the economic incentives that we can't just change course on our own. So how does well, that fit in? Nor would we want America to behave utterly independently of the rest of the world. But the, how to put this, 
In terms of the sharing of the burden of the sacrifice, when America adopted the trade policies that it did, Western Europe and East Asia were much poorer than the United States as a result of the two world wars and the devastation they brought. Is their infrastructure better than ours now? Are their trains better and faster than all of the rest? Right? In other words, would it make sense to adjust our trade policies because Western Europe and East Asia no longer needs this? Will that be popular in the US? It absolutely will. Will it be viewed with great dismay in Western Europe and East Asia? It absolutely will. Can you overdo it? You can. Uh, in the 1950s, the US constituted just 6% of the world's population, but it produced and consumed half of everything made and sold on Earth. Uh, and so you can, open, in other words, once you turn the ship in one direction on trade, immigration, if you like, uh, you can. Uh, it's hard to turn it again, uh, but at some point, the pressures, in other words, the economy may be international. Politics and governance is still national, right? And that's really the, the disconnect that is going on. The demand increasingly is for an economy that looks better for people who are here. Well, I have a sense, and this is, you can tell me if you disagree or not. You know, I, I guess, I won't say that we've been pessimistic, but I want to move to the more optimistic sort of view as, as we, we come to the end of our, our time together. So your book, Promised Land, has the subtitle, How the Rise of the Middle Class Transformed America, 1929 to 1960. Here's the subtitle for your next book, okay? <laughs> and the next book that I'm suggesting, this is something else which, talk which is how the revival of the middle class transformed America 2021 to 2050. So give us an optimistic <laughs> view. Give us something positive that we can take away uh, that President Biden will do, we will do achieve as a country together and, and where we can be in a positive state 20 years from now. I guess what I would say is the rise of the middle class the last time produced a flawed result. Were there drawbacks? To that system, their work. So if you want to be positive, can you, if you work on it, you sit in a group, think of how you could design a new and improved version of that system that's more flexible with respect to gender roles and gender relations, that's more mindful of the dangers of mass middle class suburbia, the dangers it can pose to the health of downtowns and folks who don't always live. I mean, you can go down the list. Uh, people, one of the short answers I give. Name something negative about the rise of the middle class. And I respond crisply and unhesitatingly, all those cigarettes. Do you remember, right? Could they afford to buy ever more cigarettes? Did they, right? And so uh, a non-smoking version of a predominantly middle-class country would be a new and improved one, if that makes sense. In other words, because that era has come and gone, have we learned things from it? Is it partially a cautionary tale? of what not to do, right? That sort of thing, as well as what to do. The real challenge is, can you do that? Uh, in other words, it, it's hard to, to, to do, but that's the, the goal. In other words, trying to recreate the, what was once before is neither desirable nor possible, right? The world has moved on from that. Trying to create some new and improved version, however, I think actually is possible, mm -hmm. right? And, but it's a process, right? There will be no one piece of legislation that will make it happen. Right? The really interesting question is, can we reorient people in that direction? To some people, it sounds like a nightmare. They don't like middle class. So what you're saying is that the middle class communities of the future, if we can create you know, stable and strong middle class communities of the future, um, might be more inclusive, more tolerant, not based on a model that you know, only white males could Correct. could that, that, that. Right. By the way, it wasn't even good ultimately for a lot of them. How much of a burden did it place on them? How profoundly unhealthy was it in certain ways, right? So, uh, but the uh, point is that the educational challenge, the founder of IBM, Thomas Watson Sr., like to say every great problem is ultimately a problem of education. In other words, getting people to understand the need for change and figuring out what the most constructive way forward is. 
Uh, but if you look at the popular culture, uh, to take the 1950s as an example, how many positive messages emanate from Hollywood about life in the 50s today? Not many, right? So uh, can you produce a one-sided and utterly unfair version of that era? You can, and which people, which cultural producers are most likely to do so? The ones who liked it the least, the most exceptional, the people for whom it did not work well, right? And that system tended to work well for people who were unexceptional in a variety of ways. But they matter too, in part because they're very numerous. And practically speaking, they're also a lot of them now very angry mm. uh, because they feel the system doesn't work well for them at all. Uh, and so that's the challenge. But actually, I honestly think our other political systems tend to be rigid in terms of party programs and philosophy. How flexible is the typical American politician? If circumstances demand a change, how philosophically flexible are most career politicians in America? Compared to many other countries, they tend to be very flexible, right? And so I actually think there is a much about the American culture that is responsive to a kind of practical adjustment. Uh, on the other hand, how long will it take before we know we're on the road to progress, Mark? Well, I don't know. You, you were about to end on a positive note there, so that's what I'm going to, <laughs> to relate to is this idea that, that we might have a more responsive and flexible political system that seems to us, and by the way, it's interesting you compare, we compare our system now to the way it was, but as you're suggesting, maybe we should compare it to other systems around the world and take heart from the fact that maybe in that comparative context, the United States will benefit. And, and in terms of the global picture, the decline of the middle class is an international phenomenon. And so it is not just an American trend trying to revive it, it's the way to get elected in Germany and Japan as well, right? Just to give two examples, or France, or Britain. Well, if, yes, we'll take the question. I just want to make a comment, not to rain on your optimistic parade, <laughs> but right we will never get there without uh, a Voting Rights Act where everyone can actually make their voices heard. And until we hold criminals accountable, including our government officials, we don't s seem to want to do that. And I'll say that Joe Biden is guilty of that as well. He's very soft on this. So as much as he loves unions and the middle class, it's all gonna go to hell and pretty quickly. And with that, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much for joining us in person for our online.